Yes, okay. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the session, Political Economic Conditions for Social Ecological Transformation, Reflections on the Euro Memorandum 2020. This is a very European uh, session in an American uh, conference. Uh, so I'm gonna start by just explaining what might not be obvious, what the Euro Memorandum uh, uh, is, uh, before I, um, I introduce uh, uh, the presenters and, and some of the household matters. So the Euromemma group is a network of progressive European economists. Both the idea for a yearly Euro memorandum and the formation of the group go back to an initiative by the late Jörg Hufschmidt. In September 1995, he invited economists from EU member states to a workshop in Strasbourg to critically question the direction of the EU economic and fiscal policy and to analyze its consequences. The focus of the discussions was on the cutbacks of the social welfare state, the deregulation of labor markets, the destruction of the environment and the steady rise of unemployment. On the basis of these debates, the group around Jörg Hufschmidt wrote the first uh, Euro memorandum in Brussels in 1996 bearing the title Full Employment, Social Cohesion and Equity for Europe, Alternatives to Competitive Austerity. Together with a list of more than 250 supporters, this declaration was published right before the Amsterdam summit in May 1997. The second Euro Memorandum followed in 1998 and since 2000 Euro Memorandum has, has been published yearly and translated into several European languages. The conception of the Euro Memoranda have remained similar throughout the years. It starts out with a survey of the current economic and social and ecological situation of the European Union. The second part focuses on the empirically and analytically substantiated criticism of the orientational politics on the European level. Thirdly, alternatives of action are developed. It should be said that uh, by way of declaration that two of the members of the panel are on the steering committee of the Euro Memorandum Group, namely, namely myself and Marcella Corsi. Uh, we will explain the status of our, our contributions in relation to the Euro Memorandum as we do our, our presentations. Um, I, uh, before I introduce the speakers, uh, I should make clear that we have asked uh, the presenters to, get, to give presentations of 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, before we go to Q&A, there are no discussions. Uh, the exception is that Marcella and Julia, uh, because it's a co-authored paper, will have 20 to 25 uh, minutes. Uh, so um, the first presentation is going to be uh, Towards the Feminist Green New Deal by Marcella Corsi and Julia Zakia, both from Sapienza, University of Rome. The second uh, paper is going to be given by myself. Uh, the title has changed. It's now From Silent to Passive Revolution, COVID-19, the European Green Deal, Socio-Ecological Transformation, and the German Question. I should also say that I'm currently a fellow at the Helsinki Collegium of Advanced Studies, so I have two affiliations, uh, that as well as the King's College London. Uh, the third paper is going to be by Gonzalo Pozo Martin uh, from Stockholm University on Eastern Constraints, a European Green New Deal, and the EU's relation with Russia. And finally, uh, quite appropriately, given that there's supposed to be a Hamiltonian moment from Hamilton College, uh, we have Alan Cafruni on the geoeconomics of the crisis. So, uh, Marcella and Julia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So I start sharing my screen. Hope you can see it. Can you? Can you confirm? Everything is clear? Yes. Thank you so much. So here we are. Just let me explain you a little bit of what you find in front of you, apart from the title that was so kindly introduced already by Magnus uh, and our names, uh, Marcella Gorzi and Giulia Zacchia. Julia will speak just at the end of my presentation. Um, but you also see a very nice uh, little lady on the top on the left uh, with the very colorful hair 
that's Minerva, is the goddess of science, uh, and uh, is also the symbol of our lab. It's a laboratory on gender diversity and gender inequality, based in the Faculty of Engineering, uh, Informatics and Statistics of Sapienza University of Rome. And as a matter of fact, uh, is our uh, environment in which we share views also in terms of uh, feminist the Green New Deal. So uh, that's why actually at the end, uh, Julia will introduce you a little bit more on what we're going on what we're doing at the moment uh, in Minerva on these topics. Uh, but as Magnus already said, uh, I'm also speaking uh, as a member of this, uh, this uh, steering committee of the Euro Memo, or the Euro Memo Group. The Euro Memo Group uh, organized every year an annual workshop. This year, for the first time, uh, the workshop was held online. And within this workshop, I have organized a panel, or better, a workshop, a number, a workshop number three, exactly on the same title of my paper. So uh, what I'm going to present to you now is actually the output of the discussion that has taken place uh, during uh, the conference, the Euro Memo conference, on this topic. And that has involved uh, also other um, important uh, um, scholars uh, on these fields. In particular, um, I want to quote uh, Alessandra Mezzandri from SOAS in London and Lorena Lombardozzi from the Open University in the UK, uh, but also other members, of course, of the steering committee, Gerard Lehrman, uh, Maria Cam Caramassini, and so on, uh, have taken part to the discussion, which is basically summarized uh, by the slides that I'm going to present. Uh, this is, by the way, the, the website of the Euromemo. I invite all of you to, uh, to go and visit it, uh, because you find quite a lot of material concerning uh, the, Euro, the Euro memorandums, so the documents that, that we produce every year as a discussion of European politics. Since last year, we are dealing specifically with the Green New Deal. Uh, so what means uh, to introduce a feminist perspective in the Green New Deal? Uh, well, uh, this is becoming, this is, uh, uh, I must say, there is a long tradition already in the feminist uh, literature uh, concerning the so-called eco-feminist uh, um, um, uh, vision. Uh, but as a matter of fact, this has become uh, even more important, uh, urgent uh, in our view, uh, because of the pandemic, because of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so the debate has increased enormously during the last year. Um, trying to understand uh, how to act uh, in order to prevent, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, the, the climate crisis, uh, um, to which quite certainly COVID-19 uh, is related as the first sign of the collapse, really, of, of the environment around us. Uh, but as I said, also in order to um, introduce uh, and to discuss a new economic paradigm, the one that I will probably uh, will introduce in a second, uh, but it's, that is usually uh, understood uh, as a caring economy new paradigm. Um, at the center of this new paradigm, there is a full recognition of the connection between the exploitation of feminized care work and the exploitation of the planet resources. Uh, this is a general view. Um, but there are two principles that are really key in understanding this type of new attitude of this new paradigm. And these two are, because actually this is the way that have been called by Diane Nelson, uh, that introduced these two principles specifically in the literature. The two are that are relevant in that sense is to first of all, uh, to recognize that paid and unpaid care work uh, usually called also informal labor, are central components of both the economy and any ecosystems. And the second R is to reduce the social and economic and ecological cost of privatized social reproduction by distributing it fairly within society and by organizing it in ways that enable efficient use of time. Time is a crucial word when we talk about care and material resources, and of course, uh, to minimize uh, waste. As I said, uh, also in my presentation, you find the specific references to some key uh, uh, works uh, by other economists with whom, uh, of course, the discussion is undergoing. 
So uh, when we speak about privatization of okay, care, I think it's quite clear what we have in mind. Uh, it's, it's quite clear what was the effect uh, of privatizing uh, the health care system uh, in order to um, face uh, the problems uh, related to the pandemic. Uh, and the countries that they reacted better are actually the one which have experienced a less privatized uh, care. Um, there is already quite enough uh, uh, evidence, uh, also statistical evidence in that sense. Uh, so the privatization of care and all other and uh, the privatization in general of all other forms of social reproduction. Social reproduction is a key word in uh, in, in the feminist economics literature, and not only economics. I would say, generally speaking, in uh, in the feminist literature, I don't have really the time to go deep into it. So I hope that the attendees uh, know what I'm talking about in case uh, we can uh, explain better during the question and answer session. In any case, um, in, uh, in the privatization of social reproduction within the household, that is basically the unit from which we start in order to understand how changes uh, should be made and how action should be taken, uh, not only is a driver, as I've written, of women's inequality, uh, but it's also resource intensive and wasteful because actually is going in exactly in the opposite direction of efficiency. And by the way, it has become more and more clear, but really had become extremely evident during the COVID-19 crisis uh, that this is really a feature of capitalism uh, that facilitates uh, in normal times uh, over consumption, over indebtedness, uh, environmental degradation, uh, and of course, uh, what comes out of it, uh, climate change. So that's why the privatization of care, the privatization of social reproduction is the enemy, if you want, uh, to fight against uh, for any good uh, Green New Deal. So let's talk a little bit more, but very quickly, about the social reproduction theory, what is usually spelled out as ASRT. So the pandemic, uh, has made quite clear that labor is at the basis of all value. We have been speaking a lot about essential labor, key well, essential labor, key workers, uh, also during this conference. But at the same time, has made clear that social reproduction in turn central is, uh, is in turn central to labor and also to survival. Uh, and by the way, all key workers in the pandemic. Uh, are basically reproductive workers uh, or workers with reproductive roles. And quite clearly, in these roles, uh, women are the majority. And not only women, but women are the majority. So that's why even earlier contribution uh, of feminist theories and feminist economics, more specifically, became extremely useful in order to draw a different paradigm nowadays and as a matter of fact uh, in the de in the development of the social reproduction theory and for this i address you to to alessandra mezzandri papers uh, a, re a very recent one uh, has just been uh, published on antigon uh, uh, we are really talking about uh, uh, institutions and architecture of care and not only about uh, care work uh, as we usually imagine it so for example child care or long-term care is a much more complex issue and care taking into account of course uh, the full meaning of the english word uh, is not just caring for people but is mostly caring for the planet so that's why the ecological and the climate emergency and the crisis of the social reproduction are strictly interlinked and mutually sustaining and that's why, as I said, uh, we must count uh, on women, uh, but not only women, of course, uh, as the main actors of the change, of the change, and therefore of the Green New Deal uh, in terms of policies to be addressed. Uh, of course, uh, in, in the context of what to do and how to care, it's quite important the issue of resources, because as a matter of fact, uh, even if uh, we are pretty aware, not all, uh, but probably at least uh, the attendees uh, that have chosen to be with us today are pretty, are pretty aware of the um, 
benefit that capit the capitalist society and the capitalist economy is taking out of the unpaid labor uh, or out of the informal labor a benefit uh, free mm? a, a free benefit actually that allows uh, more exploitation and higher profit for those that exploit of course this type of labor at the same time there is an issue of low wages and low income for these people if we are not taking just totally unpaid work when when we speak about social reproduction we speak also about uh, essential workers as i said and in that case uh, these people receive a wage but usually it's very low and it might become uh, not only very low but also unstable because of the lack uh, of um, or because of their precarious forms of labor because of the lack of decent labor as the ILO would specify it so it's quite clear that we must uh, uh, also address the issue of how many resources uh, to give to these people in order to allow them uh, to play an effective role uh, in our society and in our economy so that's why during the workshop that we organized at Euromemo there was a large discussion about uh, UBI. Uh, as you certainly know, this, is, uh, this has become uh, more and more urgent, even uh, for the European Commission, you can imagine. So um, quite a lot of uh, new measures uh, are, are going to be taken in order to uh, sustain uh, uh, the most vulnerable part of our population in Europe. But as a matter of fact, the UBI is not the only solution. As a matter of fact, in the literature, but also in the current discussion, and especially as in a feminist discussion, that quite uh, for the large majority is against UBI, even if I don't have the time now to spell out totally this uh, uh, this, uh, this this um, uh, this, uh, this 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 this, uh, this discussion. In any case, especially in in, uh, in the, the feminist literature, there are alternatives that are considered more effective than UBI, and these are universal basic services and universal basic infrastructure. Uh, I refer during the workshop to the contribution by Lorena Lombardozzi that has published quite recently a very nice paper on this topic. Uh, you find it in the slides that I uploaded on the website in case you are interested more specifically on this topic, of course, come back to us, first of all, in the question and answer, and then, of course, uh, if you want, uh, in, 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 in direct contact by mail. But anyway, the, there is a huge discussion about all this. Um, UBI certainly claims to offer new routes uh, of subsistence uh, to all, uh, and especially to the vulnerables. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, UBS uh, uh, can be a proposal to take the provision of certain necessities out of the commodity sphere. So to fight against the commodification, once again, of care, first of all, and when we speak about service in, the, in this case, uh, we certainly can rely to child care services and to long term care, care services, especially for the elderly, and uh, can provide them uh, free of charge to anyone who needs uh, or wants them. Um, within this context, when we speak about universal basic infrastructure, we can speak about social housing and uh, as social housing at zero rent, uh, free meals uh, to households in food insecurity, free bus pass schemes to people of all ages. Uh, but of course, uh, and this has become more and more important because of the lack of relationship uh, due to the pandemic, also phone, phone and internet uh, uh, free license for all. Uh, that is important for our youngest, uh, uh, for attending schools, uh, like for the elderly to get connected uh, with their beloved. So in that sense, uh, universal basic infrastructure and universal basic services can be really adopted as a way out um, or to give resources uh, to people, to vulnerables, uh, in, uh, as a complement somehow also for the discussion about universal basic income. Finally, there is a crucial word and a crucial uh, uh, attention in this new paradigm for the terms diversity. 
uh, as you've seen, our lab is a lab on diversity and gender inequality. So you can imagine this is quite crucial for us. So there is a need within this feminist Green New Deal to um, redefine uh, a bottom-up transformation uh, with specific uh, attentions for LGBTQ people, uh, uh, elderly people, and so on. I have just one minute, so I ju just want to stress uh, that we have uh, uh, three links uh, that are really interesting for you to explore. Uh, one is the Feminist Green New Deal principle drafted in the, U in the US by a collective uh, of feminist uh, uh, scholars. Uh, then we have a feminist Green New Deal for the UK by the Women Budget Group. And then we have, last but not least, the Purple Pact adopted by the women, uh, women's lobby at European level. I invite all of you to look at these links uh, to explore more in detail uh, this type of new paradigm. And I finish here with this slide, and then I give the floor to Julia, uh, because this is actually the website uh, of Minerva. As you can see, uh, you can find on this website quite a lot of information. Uh, but first of all, I want to show you our next seminars. Uh, I invite all of you, of course, to follow the seminars. As you can see, unfortunately, we had to adopt the English as colonial language. This brings me back to the discussion in the first two days uh, uh, on decolonizing uh, economics. But as a matter of fact, uh, uh, it means also that all of you can have access uh, uh, just sending me a, a mail to our seminars. And you are most welcome. Julia, the floor is yours now. Yes, thank you so much. And actually, I will link to this and, uh, of course, to all the activities of Minerva Lab, that is, uh, once more, it's a laboratory on diversity and gender equality. Uh, since we are organizing both seminars, but uh, we also trying to, I mean, also give some uh, uh, real uh, uh, definitions of what Marcella also theoretically explains so well. So actually, I mean, what we are trying to uh, to, to, to develop and uh, what we are doing right now is uh, a uh, quite uh, interesting international uh, uh, project that uh, is called uh, DALILA and uh, DALILA is staying for the development of new uh, academic curricula on uh, sustainable en energy and green economies in Africa. Uh, the data is really connected with the issues of environment and sustainability. Actually, in January uh, 2020, so uh, it's brand new, uh, just before the COVID-19, so we had the opportunity to travel to Africa uh, just once in uh, the, the life of this project. Um, with Minerva Lab, uh, we uh, started, I mean, uh, this uh, project that was financed by the uh, Erasmus Plus uh, uh, project capacity building uh, that try to use an interdisciplinary and international approach in higher education to tangle the complexity of green energy, of renewable energy, and sustainability, that sustainability in the sense of social, economic, and environmental sustainability. So actually, um, the project uh, can be seen as an example of uh, uh, the university's third mission. So how uh, a university uh, can really contribute um, in reality uh, to a better, to a better society, to a more inclusive and equal uh, society. So actually, with uh, our project. Uh, um, we aim at establishing in uh, partner universities in Uganda and in Tanzania. So we have partners uh, that are closely working with us. Can you hear me? Because I, I hear some noise. Okay, perfect. Uh, we aim at establishing in uh, our partner university in Uganda and Tanzania new courses about renewable uh, technologies and green economy. Uh, so actually, um, we are um, creating these new courses uh, uh, with the aim of providing students with uh, capacity to understand 
the crucial uh, climate, climate process and their uh, different impacts. So impacts in terms of social impact, economic impact, but also uh, gender impacts, actually, because we know that there are huge differences. And when we speak about gender once more, uh, since, again, uh, the history of our laboratory is about diversity, we don't uh, apply a binary uh, definition, but just I mean, a more inclusive and uh, intersectional dimensions of gender. Uh, to comprehend also uh, the core technical and economic and financial element of renewable energy, so there would be also really technical uh, courses, but also we involve and we try to involve all the students and all the uh, academic and also not academic uh, institutions since we are involved with also NGOs and local NGOs to discuss and to try to find a notable strategy for gender group uh, growth uh, for I mean, different kind of uh, stakeholder that can be involved in different local contexts. Because I mean, actually we have uh, different uh, university in different contexts also within the single African countries. Um, so uh, we also stress how important it is to recognize the sustainable growth gender, social, economic equity, and the crucial role of care, as Marcella stressed in the, the first part of this page, in the economy for reaching a sustainable green transition of uh, economic system. And this is how it's crucial also for Africa. And so that's why we are, I mean, we are trying to uh, work all together so with our also African colleagues to reach this, uh, uh, to try to reach more people and to try, try, to try to reach also younger students. And let me say that, I mean, how it's wonderful to, I mean, be involved in these international uh, relations and cooperative uh, environment since, I mean, we have a lot to learn and we have a lot to share, I mean, in the logic of diversity in whole, I mean, in environment, in the social being, and uh, in our society. So I will stop here since uh, I think that uh, our time is uh, uh, is brand. And of course, if you have any, um, uh, if you want to have any information about also the project and that, I mean, we are running, please write me and uh, we'll give you also uh, the link uh, and we have a website where we have also some e-learning and Moodles uh, uh, that courses that are already ready and so you can see it, what we are doing right now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and very good timekeeping both of you. That's great. I'll see whether I can, I can uh, be as disciplined as you are. Um, so uh, my presentation, I'm going to put up my screen oh. what happened to it great now i can't find my powerpoint just a moment great you think everything is going to work perfectly and then ah there it is there we are. Can you see that? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, from silent revolution, from silent to passive revolution. So in my paper really focuses on, and let's be very frank about this, the very, very fraught strategic terrain in Europe for advancing the kind of progressive policies that the Euro Memorandum uh, group advocates. It's really more a kind of a, if you will, a concrete utopian Sorelian myth kind of kind of proposals that we have in order to sort of help to engender mobilization for another Europe. But I'm trying to focus on the much more pessimistic aspect, which is the strategic terrain. But there have been interesting developments in Europe and uh, very, very recently. So I, I, want, to, I want to assess that. Um, so in terms of sort of defining some of the terms then in the, in the title, uh, silent revolution, 
refers to what Jose Manuel Barroso himself uh, called all the deepening of neoliberal reforms and in an increasingly authoritarian way that came in the wake of the Eurozone crisis. And the best way I think of capturing this was what another uh, commissioner at the time, Mario Monti, or an ex-commissioner, Mario Monti, the commissioner for competition, said. He said, thank God for the Greek crisis. Everything that we wanted to try to do in terms of deepening uh, privatization of services and all of those things have now become possible. And I think to say, the silent revolution was really kind of along the lines of Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, that the sort of the crisis becomes a, and the shock that it generates becomes a kind of a context in which, in which neoliberalism can actually move forward despite the crisis that is created themselves. So the silent revolution was really about executive uh, power, mobilizing the power of debt without resort to devaluation as in the Eurozone to deepen neoliberalism and indeed in a more authoritarian way, the authoritarian neoliberalism with the memorandums of understanding uh, the European semester and all those kind of things. Passive revolution is of course taken from Gramsci. And uh, for Gramsci, a passive revolution emerges because of geopolitical pressure and legitimation crisis. And it's a top-down attempt to preemptively broaden the power base that has become too narrow in a quote-unquote molecular fashion by co-opting uh, opposition. This was originally devised to analyze post-Napoleonic 19th century Europe by Gramsci. And Gramsci concluded that passive revolutions are rarely confined within their parameters. Um, and why talk about this? Well, there has been some recent uh, quite significant EU reform initiatives, uh, which has raised the question, is and indeed another Europe possible? Uh, in monetary policy, you have the uh, pandemic emergency purchasing program uh, of the ECB of one, uh, uh, 1,350 billion uh, euros. Uh, quantitative easing had already started with the different asset, asset purchasing process, uh, programs, but this has taken it to an entirely new level, of course, in the context of, of, of COVID-19. Uh, we also have, in fiscal policy, Next Generation EU, which has been hailed by uh, the German finance minister, Olaf Scholz, as a Hamiltonian moment. So we finally sort of coming to some kind of a, a, a situation where, where Europe embraces a, uh, some kind of fiscal federalism. So you have a 750 uh, billion euro uh, Europe level recovery program, uh, which raises the EU budget from about one to 2% of uh, GD, GDP, rather GDI. It's to be deficit funded. It uh, entails the issuing of euro bonds and it has a significant element of fiscal transfer. All of this was watered down by the so-called frugal four. 37% of this then, and I think that these should be understood as conjunctural uh, initiatives to the much broader structural uh, uh, initiative, which is the European Green Deal, which is the pet project of the incoming president uh, of the commission, uh, Ursula von Leyen. Uh, and the European Green Deal essentially seeks to gold plate EU's Paris Agreement commitments, aiming to reduce EU's 2030 carbon emissions to 55% of 1990 levels, as opposed to the commitment of the Paris Agreement of 40%. Uh, percent. And uh, the European Green Deal uh, proposes a number of policies to do that, to extend uh, Europe's uh, carbon emission trading schemes, to include maritime and air transport, uh, to introduce actually a kind of an active uh, tariff policy again through the so-called carbon border adjustment mechanism for those who do not observe the Paris Agreement. Commitment to a circular, econ circular economy action plan through regulations and financial incentives, a sustainable and smart uh, mobility strategy, a farm to fork strategy in agriculture to promote biodiversity, a zero pollution action plan on air, water and soil. Uh, and the funding of this was initially to be through a sustainable Europe investment plan 
uh, 1 trillion euros uh, until 2030. Uh, leverage, uh, 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 which leverages EU and member state funds uh, also by raising private uh, uh, funding uh, to be administered through Invest EU, which is an initiative through the European Investment Bank. Uh, so, in relation to these things, uh, my paper uh, argue in brief by way of three propositions. Uh, these reform initiatives are usefully understood as a passage from silent to passive revolution with attendant limitations and openings. Secondly, the passive revolution in the EU should be posed in terms of the universal contradiction of German leadership. At first glance, uh, all this goes against what the EU has stood for in terms of EU economic governance. Nevertheless, I argue that this is not flash in the pan. Rather, it should be seen as a pragmatic response to the long-term situation of German capital and Germany's domestic power block. It addresses risks associated with that, bets that a silent revolution made on emerging markets, most notably China, and the discounting of the European home market, especially the, so the systems critical Italy. Still, essentially, uh, uh, it is a policy of continuity which limits severely uh, their prospects for genuine social ecological transformation. And I think that the, here is where the Euro Memorandum comes in. The Euro Memorandum 2020 and also 2021, which is in the process of drafting, I think highlights this very, very well. Uh, my third proposition is that openings for a genuine social ecological transformation and progressive poli uh, uh, politics is one of form rather than substance. Uh, the reforms uh, and the passive revolution compromises the ter territorial non-correspondence between a federal level monetary policy and a member state level fiscal industrial policy which is entailed in a Hayekian interstate federalism and which has been central to uh, European governance, at least since the launching of the European monetary system in the 1970s and where Germany has exercised leadership. Uh, but this actually starts to compromise this in terms of the form of the territorial non-correspondence. And social ecological transformation requires of us the further politicization of these breaches to try to expand them and to uh, resist their depoliticization after a brief period of severe exception. So I think that we're up for an impending struggle over the applicability of the European sem semester and the conditionalities to next generation EU, which have been temporarily suspended under COVID-19. Uh, and we have to, you know, one important side to struggle is to struggle uh, against the reassertion of these uh, conditionalities. Another thing that this is wrought up to is the whole, the, the question of finance-led capitalism, which is also another way of talking about EU's dependence on the United States. So the structure, so that's the essence of the argument. The structure of the paper is then threefold. Uh, I, the first part of the paper presents the European Green Deal uh, or social ecological transformation. And this part rehearses essentially the Euro Memorandum critique of the 2020 and now the 2021 Euro Memorandum. The second part of the paper elaborates on what it means to talk about a German uh, leadership of a European economic governance as a universal contradiction. And the third part is about Germany, European integration and passive revolution past and present. The difference between the second and the third part is the, the, the second part is essentially about the structure. It's a synchronic account. Uh, and the uh, third one is a diachronic account that deals with the prospects of change and the way that Germany manages change. So I, I'm now gonna, for the remainder, I'm gonna elaborate a bit on uh, uh, on these uh, three different uh, sections and see how, how much time I have for that. Uh, so uh, the European Green Deal or social ecological transformation. Uh, the Euro memo take of the European Green Deal is that its aims is to be welcomed in principle, 
but the measures are insufficient and an external policy outright wrong-headed. Uh, the critique is in part one of quantity. When you actually sort of cut through the uh, SEIP uh, and the, the accounting of it, only 7.5 billion euros is actually new money. Uh, it's different with the next generation EU, of course, but it only meets about a quarter of southern member state financial needs. And it, uh, the Euro memo rehearses the argument that the EU budget should be at least 5% of EU GDI. Uh, but it's also a qualitative uh, uh, critique. The blended finance of, uh, of the European Green Deal, which mainly is about using public money to leverage private financial capital, suggests, in short, that nothing has been learned from the crisis of finance-led capitalism. So it's continuity in that regard. Uh, in external policy, it's out, outright wrong-headed. Uh, the free trade and investment agenda that it uh, uh, remains committed to is out, outright contradicting the European Green Deal. It, the trade and investment agreements will not allow the European Green Deal to do what it sets out to do in terms of uh, tariffs and industrial policy. There is also significant issue of carbon and environmental leakage to the other parts of the world, an extractivism, uh, an extractivist agenda with reference particularly to the global south and geopolitical rivalry with uh, particularly China. And uh, uh, particularly we're looking at a, a, you know, a, a, a new scramble for Africa. And this becomes very, very clear when you look at another EU document, the so-called action plan for critical raw materials that suggests that EU will need 60 times more lithium than it does new by 2050. And you can continue to go down the list of critical uh, raw materials. Um, so as an alternative to this Euro memo, uh, social ecological transformation suggests that rather than being dependent on blended finance, it suggests a 5 trillion 10 year public investment program that should be no less than 320 uh, billion euros per year should be financed by EU-wide green bonds issued by European Investment Bank and guaranteed by the ECB and EU-wide corporate taxes. should be based on the phasing out of the uh, carbon emission trading scheme by way of buybacks and elimination of permits. should be replaced by a carbon emission tax. Uh, uh, Marcella has talked about the social and uh, uh, gendered aspects of uh, and the reproductive aspects of uh, what this entails in terms of concrete policy. But apart from that, the investment plan should uh, promote sustainable transport systems, energy efficiency, and renewable energy, sustainable agro production. It should be based on demilitarization, high quality uh, universal education, and ICT expansion in line with ILO definitions of good work. Uh, 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 the governance of the New Deal should be based on transparency and strong political le leadership and grassroots uh, participation. Uh, but of course, there is massive institutional resistance to this that is hardwired into EU governance. And this raises the question of the power of Germany. Uh, so I think it's useful to think about this by way of what Martin Nicholas who I think is most known for being the translator of uh, Marx's Grundrisse from German to English. But he had an article in New Left Korea 1970, which I think is quite useful. And basically the idea of a universal contradiction is that the hegemon projects a universal principle, but it does it from the uh, perspective of particular parochial circumstances. That, and these are the ones that underpin this projection. And you can understand this in terms of, on the one hand, German leadership have forced discipline and neoliberalism, new constitutionalism, Ahiekian's interstate federation in Europe. Yet at the same time, Germany has been the most labor, one of the most labor inclusive welfare capitalisms and most developed industrial policy, uh, has had the most developed industrial policy apparatuses in Europe, when you scratch a bit on the surface. The key mediating link has been, of course, export-oriented, non-price-sensitive oligopolistic capital, where investment goods sector is dominant. So the key for thinking about German change is to look at that. Uh, this is all part of an integral hegemonic configuration until 1966, and from then on, ensuring export orientation within a broader process of European stagnation and neoliberalization has been the agenda. So we have to understand, and starting with the EMS, 
going through the EMU and so on and so forth. And we have, the, have to understand the passive revolution in terms of the limitations of that hegemonic strategy. Uh, and so let me talk about some of the limitations that uh, Germany is running up to. And this is the, the third part of the paper. And what I want to point out here is that Germany is not a, an, an, an immovable object. Uh, and there has been precedents that have indicated German flexibility and pragmatism when required. Very, very much similar to what uh, the Germans did with the pandemic uh, uh, response and came on board with, with France. In 1978, uh, Helmut Schmidt made a similarly dramatic uh, U-turn when he actually came uh, on board and embraced European monetary cooperation with the European monetary system. Uh, of course, that turned out to be a very disciplinary neoliberal uh, uh, mechanism. But Schmidt was actually, when you look at the process, willing to compromise on a much more symmetrical parity grid where the EQ would have been the reference currency and not the, the mark, and which would have generated much more symmetrical uh, adjustments, as well as the European Monetary Fund. And all this is aimed to bring the UK and Italy into the exchange mechanism to avoid the threat of devaluation and US-induced prostrate turbulence with US dollar unilateralism. And it was actually France, not Germany, that vetoed the European Monetary Fund in 1978. And uh, it is true that on the parity grid, eventually the Bundesbank got uh, Schmidt to uh, to push on the on the German mark being the reference, but there was more movement here than uh, what uh, one can look at in in terms of looking back at the balance sheet. There are certain current factors that make Germany willing to compromise on the non-correspondence of monetary and fiscal industrial policy. And you actually also see, for example, the German uh, Federation of Industry. Uh, coming on board with a number of industrial policy and also sort of coming on board that we need some kind of transfer uh, union mechanism in the in the EU. You can look at, uh, at figures such as Peter Altmaier, the Minister of Economic Affairs from, uh, from the CDU, uh, being very much in favor of, of, of more industrial policy. And interestingly, Jörg Kukis, um, who is the, State Secret the Secretary of State and Minister of Finance under Olaf Scholz, and was a key mover for the pandemic recovery program, SPD, but formerly of Goldman Sachs. Uh, there are a number of factors that sort of pushes this German pragmatism today. It's the increased price sensitivity of exports that makes a sole reliance on export orientation fraught. And I think that th there is a kind of a movement towards sort of looking more towards the European home market. A breakup of the house bank, the much touted house bank system may paradoxically soften the aversion to inflation risk such as they are today. It was actually this, this sort of seen as one of the progressive elements of the, of the German model was actually something that pushed price stability because it was based on lending short, uh, borrowing short and lending long. And this of course, so there might be opportunities here. Thirdly, China is increasingly seen not merely as an outlet for exports and investment, but also as a strategic rival. For example, the KUKA takeover and more generally, the general decline of German companies as global leaders. Finally, the prospects of a system critical Italian exit, and particularly the phenomenon of a Salvini, has genuinely spooked Germany. Yet, uh, this has to be seen against the context of a complete dependence on American finance, particularly within the transnational financial uh, finance market and in the collateral markets. And these set alter clear limits on what, what, uh, what Europe can do under, under German leadership. There is really no... Uh, a challenge to uh, to the financial aspect, the financial the capitalism aspects of this, and all these things are uh, are seen as being advanced within the co uh, the context of the of the European semester and and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, I think I am there because my time is out. Thank you very much. So uh, right. I'm now on uh, as chair, so uh, Gonzalo. Okay, well, thanks very much, um, uh, Magnus, um, and uh, thanks to, to everyone else on, else on the panel and attending, attending the session. Um, so 
way I thought about this intervention originally was as a kind of critique of the Euro memo and its particular limits with regards to, to Russia uh, and the geopolitical uh, relation, or I think better said the, the broadly political relationship between, between Russia and the European Union since the 1990s and what kinds of limitations that offered in terms of any prospects for a Green New Deal, ours or theirs, it didn't, it didn't really matter. Um, the more I, I worked on this and the, and the more I looked at it, the more it became a double critique. Um, so what was originally intended to uh, be a comment on the Euro memo and what I uh, felt were omissions, particularly on the geopolitical side and the um, uh, energy dependency side of the, of the European Union, which even a critical document like this um, couldn't, couldn't really afford to, to make, I, I thought. Um, at the same time, uh, it became also a running commentary more broadly on the actual European Green uh, uh, New Deal, which, you know, or, or if you like, uh, van der Leyen's European Man on the Moon moment, or what Yanis Varoufakis earlier on this year in the pages of, of The Guardian called a colossal exercise in greenwashing by, by, the European, uh, by the European Union. So the way I want to structure this kind of double critique of the, if you like, the really existing green, Euro European Green Deal uh, and the kind of emissions that come out of the Euro Memo's proposals for a better uh, green, green New Deal, I want to structure them as, as follows. I first want to say something to contextualize the relationship between Russia and the European Union uh, and, and, to, and to make a kind of meta-narrative, if you like, comment about how they are usually uh, mythologized, um, because I think it's important to, to get rid of some, uh, of, of some of these mythologies that are all too, too pervasive. I then want to make a couple of comments very briefly on the nature of the Russian state, or if you like, the, the Russian capitalist state uh, nexus or, or animal, because I think it provides a very specific kind of um, anchor um, for a very warped relationship with the European Union or with any other uh, uh, big economic space or big states uh, in general. It's inevitable to speak about Russia and the EU and the kind of temporal and spatial limits that sets to any future thinking about uh, any kind of green conversion uh, of European economy without touching on Ukraine. Um, I mean, they know that in the Kremlin, so we should also, uh, and they know that in Brussels and they know that everywhere. So we, we should also touch a little bit on Ukraine. The issue on Ukraine in particular with regards to the, the European Green Deal is, is quite a fundamental one because as I'm going to try to argue, every, uh, you know, all strategies of trying to cut dependency from Russian gas exports pass through attempts at diversifying uh, from uh, transit routes uh, from, from Russia into the European Union for that, for that gas. And there are other alternatives to that as well. Uh, but so, so Ukraine is in many senses a very important piece of the puzzle. Finally, I want to come down to uh, the energy relation between Russia and the European Union um, itself. Um, by now, I think that's a relatively easy one to, to summarize uh, and without kind of, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, spoiling any, any sort of suspense or any kind of expectation on the uh, on, the, on the end of that, obviously, Russian dominance over uh, the European energy future is, is quite extreme, as I'll try to document. But I think that one of the very interesting aspects of that is that the European Union has been extremely and unimaginative in trying to break those, those, uh, those um, dependence uh, uh, links to, to Russia in terms of gas and less so of, of oil. So that's what I what I wanted to 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 um, say. Those are the, the few steps. I'll try to be as brief as possible for each of them, and hopefully I can end before my time, and we can all go home soon. Now, um, okay. So first of all, um, the I think there's a twin mythology 
that kind of frames very, very heavily the relationship between Russia and the European Union and provides a kind of almost exclusive filter. Um, and I want to talk about that in terms of, on the one hand, the chronopolitics, if you like, of, of European politics vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and then the kind of geopolitical ploy whereby by some kind of you know, evil Rasputinian uh, reflex, the Kremlin is always sort of playing chess with, with Europe geopolitically and so on and so forth. I want to dispel both mythologies, talk about them quite quickly and dispel them um, because I want to ground us a little bit more in the commercial realities of what I think mark the, the, Euro the European-Russian relation. So the chronopolitics involves very, very briefly, a sense that somehow east of, uh, east of the European Union, of course, even within the European Union, the further east you get, the more that's the case. But you know, once the European uh, eastern borders end, some kind of temporal collapse back happens, uh, and you end up in a 20th century world, whereas the European Union is markedly a cosmopolitan, liberal, um, 21st century political animal. Um, we'll see this kind of ploy coming back when I describe a little bit of the elements of the Russian-European uh, uh, relationship. We can see that, for instance, um, the European Green New Deal has a veneer of geopolitical uh, virtuosity because for some commentators, this is supposed to maybe be the way in which to softly, you know, very cleverly, very uh, un 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 unintrusively to start cuddling and wheedling Russia into its own green transition, a very, very unlikely prospect anyway. But that's supposed to be what the European Union is capable of doing simply by very gentle, uh, very gentle uh, policies, such as, for instance, uh, carbon taxes at the border, for instance, which, of course, have Russian industrialists very, very, very scared at the minute. This is one of the one of the elements of the Green New Deal that has not been yet detailed, but is on the cards and has enormous implications for 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 Russian economy. So we'll come back to to that point. But this chronopo uh, chronopolitical aspect where Russia does annexation and war, uh, espionage in the, in the worst cliche 20th century way, uh, and the European Union does the summits, you know, interest negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. The other kind of concomitant view is that Russia is essentially, because it's such a, a 20th century beast in a way, remains uh, remains a geopolitical player in a non-geopolitical world. And Russia is out permanently to try to scoop some kind of geopolitical advantage every time the European Union lets its guard off, uh, and, you know, and try to derail democratic procedures and processes every time the European Union has turned its gaze, and so on. The reality, whether politically, commercially, uh, or indeed diplomatically, um, is, is quite different. It's one of very, very, very steep interdependence. And this steep interdependence has very specific commercial and economic contours, okay? It's, it's, harder to, it's harder to make the case for that in the case of the European Union. But now let me uh, go on then to my, the, the, the second big point I want to make in, in this presentation. The commercial aspect of the Russia-EU relationship is quite essential for the very nature of Russian political economy after the fall uh, of, um, of the Soviet Union. So um, this is something that um, uh, in, in different places I've, I've tried to argue and, uh, uh, and advance, um, but basically because out of a process of very traumatic and institutionally extremely flawed, very corrupt, uh, passages towards uh, market economic uh, 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 impulses, not even not even an economy in any in any uh, important sense of the word, because of the particular botched ways and uneven ways in which the transition to a market economy was carried out in in Russia in the early and mid nineties, and of course with enormous involvement, financial involvement, and political help um, and applause of the West and of the Clinton administration in particular, um, the Russian state has emerged 
as a highly concentrated kind of uh, bond between an extremely concentrated economic elite uh, and uh, a very high profile kind of bureaucrat that exist in a kind of codependence. And I'm, I won't make the full argument, but the, the basic idea is that if you're a policymaker in Russia, there's an element of uh, reliance on, um, on profits in order precisely to carry out policy and the other way around. Profit making requires some kind of deep access to, to state and state connections and so on. Um, and the way in which, in particular, uh, Putin has reorganized this is in a highly, uh, in a highly concentrated uh, state, um, state apparatus, where, in a sense, he represents some kind of uh, uh, very narrow space for negotiation between these, these two kinds of impulses. Well, if you buy that, and I think you should, um, I'm really convinced about that, this has an enormous foreign policy implication. And the implication is that because of the particular dependence on uh, hydrocarbons for Russian political economy, so for instance, Russian gas exports uh, are 30% of its GDP, and Gazprom is 5% of Russian GDP. Um, and gas promise in a sense, therefore, a kind of enormous public, semi-public, private company that exists very, very closely uh, uh, knitted with uh, uh, the different ministries and so on and so forth. This whole lens in specific areas of Russian foreign policy, it lends it an expansionist, um, an expansionist uh, uh, quality. In other words, there is something about the spaces in which Russian economic infrastructure, particularly around hydrocarbons, are set up. That means that the Russian state and Russian business isn't very, very dependent, dependent on controlling them. The, the specific sociological, if you like, um, uh, profile of this state uh, business uh, uh, elite in, in Russia is extremely short termist for the most part, as again, I'll, I'll say something more about when we come to the hydrocarbon relation between uh, uh, Europe and Russia. So in other words, beyond the kind of myths of the evil Russian bear, uh, geopolitically out to get the, the, the Europeans and this kind of virtual, uh, you know, kind of cosmopolitan Europe, that has transcended the gaming of geopolitics, there's a deep political economic reality in Russia, especially so, marked by the very state building of Russia after the fall of, of communism in the, in, the early, in the early 90s. And part of the, uh, part of the uh, excursions into Eastern Ukraine and so on have to do, in a sense, with ensuring some short, midterm, plausible uh, profitability for this very concentrated elite, um, which is, you know, uh, very nasty, very corrupt, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all this comes to, all this comes to a big, uh, to a big uh, conflagration in Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine, the key date, and this is a date that we come back to in terms of the European Union's own shifting energy policies uh, is, is the, the year for that is 2014, which is, of course, the annexation of Ukraine. Um, sorry, the annexation of Crimea, if only. The annexation of, of Crimea, of course, is a reunification from the Russian side. So there's always, there's always two, two sides for that story. But this, this kind of long drawn out drama in, uh, in, in Eastern Ukraine, the Donbass, Crimea, and so on, had a number of uh, uh, rehearsals in 2006 and 2009, most, most especially, around precisely the issue of gas disputes and around the issue of the role of Ukraine as a transit country of Russian gas uh, into, into Europe at moments of growing European gas uh, 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 demand. Um, now, what 
what happened after 2009 for a little while was that the um, international aspect of the conflict between Europe and, uh, and Russia over the transit role of Ukraine for its gas became internalized into Russian, into Russian politics. And this was a kind of tension that blew open in 2014 with the EU and Yanukovych having this kind of dance about possible uh, uh, agreements and partnerships with the European Union, uh, kind of turning its back on Putin's own project of a Eurasian Union on the other side, which was happening at the same time. And a Eurasian Union for, from the point of view of Russia makes no sense without, without Ukraine, of course. And then, um, uh, and then Russian intervention in Ukraine, essentially creating a frozen conflict at the heart of Europe with no end in sight, no, no solution uh, uh, imaginable for the time being, and one in which Russia clearly has all the chips, um, and one that very quickly subdued much European opposition uh, to, to Russian advance in, in Ukraine. And this, of course, despite the fact that the Russian Federation had acknowledged the full sovereignty and independence of the Ukrainian state in the, 19, in the 1990s. So that's, in a sense, the very kind of uh, very volatile um, uh, context of political or diplomatic context to the problems of, um, uh, of energy relations between Ukraine and Russia. What I think is quite striking is the way in which those contrast to the slight um, smoothness of the uh, commercial relationship around gas. Um, in fact, um, well, let me let me just let me just try to let me just to tr try to to give a profile of of the um, of, of the general contours of Russian European uh, hydrocarbon relations. So the Russian dominance over the EU energy market, oil, but of course, very particularly gas, is quite enormous. So Russian exports are about a third of the EU's total. Of EU member states, 12 member states within the European Union imports more than 75% of their gas from Russia. Five of them are entirely dependent from Russian imports. Um, and just after that, after that list of 12 comes Germany, which imports from Russia almost half of its natural uh, gas. And Russia, of course, is the first provider of gas to the European Union, followed only by, um, by Norway. Norway is about three times smaller a gas provider to the European market. And then there's a number of other um, uh, natural gas providers that come from the Middle East and from North Africa, the sum total of which doesn't, doesn't really uh, cloud uh, Russian, the, the Russian profile in this relationship. Now, in the context of all the uh, geopolitical turbulence that I've very, very briefly and perhaps clumsily been trying to, to outline, Russian gas exports to Europe actually increased over 2016 and 2017 and into 2018. So at the worst moments in the, in the fallout of the Ukrainian fragmentation and uh, civil war, or if you like, conflict by, by proxy, um, uh, nevertheless, Europe, Europe continued um, uh, importing more gas from, from Russia. So according to, to, to Gazprom, uh, I won't bore you with very specific numbers. One minute, Gonzalo, one minute. One minute? Oh, yeah. no. Well, OK. Um, so it's uh, European reliance on, on Russian gas is, is very high. Um, but at the same time, it's very stable. Russia has been able to settle a number of economic disputes with the WTO in August uh, 2018, and with the European Commission itself in May 2018, in a way that has stabilized, uh, um, that has stabilized pricing, that has made Russia a much more reliable partner, that has made Russia a much more competitive partner for its gas imports, and so on. 
The European Union, and I'm trying to skim very quickly through the basic points, the European Union had signed a number of agreements with Russia in the late 90s and in 2000, and particularly this green paper called the, towards a European strategy for energy supply in 2000, that relied entirely on Russia in 2000. In 2014, it turned it back, its back on that completely and looked at liquefied natural gas, trying to seek to exploit advantages uh, of liquefied natural gas all over the world. Now, just the two, the two main, the two main points, and I finish with that. Um, the, the basic points is that while the European Union tries to look for uh, liquefied uh, LNG supplies as a way of diversification, there's no actual real plan or real prospect of LNG actually diminishing Russia's role as the main supplier over the next two or three decades, which is essentially the time frame in which any European Green New Deal uh, can can uh, can make its credibility, um, <clears throat> and so uh, and so it seems that this in reality is not a relationship that is in any case uh, addressed realistically. So the, either um, as a as a matter of policy in a European Green New Deal within within Brussels, or for any kind of other radical um, alternative, that seems to be a kind of strong. Uh, international limit to, to the idea of a Green New Deal in Europe. Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, Alan. All right, thank you very much, Magnus. Uh, so it's Can I just, just say before that, is, uh, there are, if you have questions, there is the Q&A function. Uh, there are no questions at the moment. Uh, there may not be any questions, but in case you don't know where to put them, there is where to put them. Okay. So my, my uh, paper is on uh, geoeconomics very broadly, and uh, in particular, the uh, growing Sino-American rivalry. And of course, Europe is uh, growing uh, increasingly and acutely vulnerable to this uh, US-China rivalry. And so the question is, and uh, there is actually quite a, a bit of overlap actually with Magnus's paper, uh, insofar as this has uh, a, a lot of bearing on uh, Germany in particular, and therefore on uh, all the progressive aspirations that we have uh, in the Euro Memorandum and, uh, and elsewhere. So historically, of course, the problematic for, for the geoeconomics for the EU has been subordination to American hegemony. And uh, we've seen that in the 1980s and beyond uh, that hegemony was transmitted uh, uh, to Europe, neoliberalism, financialization. Uh, so there wasn't uh, uh, the development of, of an autonomous growth model in Europe. Uh, the, the Maastricht Treaty, uh, EMU, the Common Foreign and Security Policy did not result in greater autonomy either, either from a monetary or from a, a military standpoint. Uh, I noticed uh, John Grawl has a recent uh, article in, in New Left Review that Magnus cited. Uh, I haven't had a chance to really look at it closely, but it's, uh, it's got a lot of information on this continuing monetary hegemony. Uh, Adam Tooze is also someone who's written, and uh, Magnus and I have actually written a bit on this ourselves. Uh, but the point is that, of course, there has been this deep con comprehensive trade an FDI relationship, uh, therefore, an Atlanticist core in global neoliberalism. Well, of course, China's ascent raises new questions. And uh, in Germany's and Europe's generally, and, and Germany's in particular, whole developmental model uh, has been predicated on emerging markets. Uh, I, I write about this a bit in my paper, and Magnus does also as, as well. Uh, German FDI into China, uh, German exports, now China the, the, the key trading partner or, or at least export uh, destination for Germany. Uh, however, United States has moved over the last decade to a containment strategy against China. It's becoming more and more uh, 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 dangerous. 
And uh, this, uh, not only does China's rise itself threaten uh, Germany and the EU from an economic standpoint, uh, but also the, the US containment strategy. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak, uh, of course, a, a bit more about this. So the question is, can Europe develop uh, what uh, Macron calls a strategic autonomy, uh, or will there in fact be a continuing Atlanticism and subordination of, uh, to the United States? Uh, and, and, and what does all this mean? The first part of my paper, uh, and I'll just summarize very, very briefly, uh, uh, describes the progression of a decades long uh, a containment strategy on the part of the United States against China. Uh, militarily, this is very, very significant, uh, massive expansion of military forces into the Asia Pacific, uh, provocative uh, relation, deepening relationship with Taiwan, uh, uh, the, the uh, renunciation of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, and uh, recently, both France and Germany have, have uh, included themselves within this, uh, within this uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, alliance structure, not, not formally, but, but uh, informally. Uh, of course, uh, trade, a trade war, and uh, added to this uh, now a technology war. And uh, finally, it, it has to be said, a very, very uh, a strident ideological offensive on the part of the United States. Uh, and we're having this uh, in the United States now. It, it, it's reminiscent of the Cold War uh, and what happened in the late 1940s and, and uh, beyond. Uh, just recently, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, called the Chinese leaders Marxist-Leninist monsters. So you get a, a sense of, of, uh, of what's happening here. Uh, well, the nature of this rivalry is, is beyond the, 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 uh, the, the scope of this paper, uh, but I did notice in ERP there, there, there was one panel, I haven't had a chance to read the papers yet, that uh, discusses this. What is China? Is it imperialist power? Uh, and so forth. And, and I won't go there uh, except to say that uh, this has all the hallmarks of a classical imperialist rivalry, however you characterize China certainly on the part of the United States. Uh, the trade war in, in, uh, that started in 2018, uh, and then a movement uh, really starting in 2019 uh, to seek to decouple the world economy or bifurcate the world economy, or in other words, to, to break up the supply chains uh, where, where uh, foreign companies are involved in, in China and to get them to, to move out of China and, and according to the Trumpian logic, at least to, to uh, return to the United States, they, they, they aren't doing that. And I, I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, as far as the, the, the outlook of the, of, uh, the US, uh, the American ruling class, uh, uh, there's, there's a tendency to, to, to uh, think of Trumpian agency in all of this, but that really has very little to do with it. Uh, they are strategically united on containment. Uh, they are still tactically divided. And uh, uh, the, I, I write about this at, at some length, but, but the point uh, is that uh, most commentators over the last four years have seen this as some sort of return to the 1930s of trade blocks and, and uh, uh, retreat uh, on the part of the United States. But it's not that, it's actually a forward strategy a very aggressive strategy of penetrating further into Asia and especially into Chinese and Asian capital markets. And uh, I present a lot of, uh, of, of uh, evidence on this. Uh, it's also technological war. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the poster child for this uh, most recently has been Huawei, the great Chinese tech company. Uh, and uh, recently, many commentators have, have uh, uh, compared the sanctions that the United States has imposed, secondary sanctions, sanctions and secondary sanctions on Huawei, uh, uh, the, uh, has compared them to the embargo on Japan uh, in 1940 and 1941 that precipitated the, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, the United States cut off oil, uh, iron, uh, uh, and other, other supplies to China. 
Uh, so uh, this uh, gives us a, a sense, uh, <laughs> we all know this, uh, of the depth of the, of the conflict. It's not something that's going to go away. Uh, uh, I don't think that the United States can contain China. Uh, Huawei, it, it is a very, very serious attack on, on Chinese technology. Uh, but in the longer run, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a very misguided strategy and, and, uh, and a very dangerous one. So we turn to the European Union and uh, turn, if, when we do this, of course, we turn to Germany uh, because Germany is the hegemon of Europe and it dictates all policies in Europe except for rhetoric. Uh, and uh, Germany has been decisive in all aspects of uh, EU policy towards China. Uh, China is, as I said, Germany's largest uh, export market now, a huge site massive site for uh, foreign direct investment. And uh, more generally, Germany's an entire, and Magnus writes a bit about this, uh, it, it, its export mercantilism really defines German strategy. Uh, uh, and it's not just Germany because it's, it's the German dominated production chains throughout Europe and especially through Central and Eastern Europe. So this is something that really, really implicates all of Germany. Uh, well, right now there is a, a crossroads, uh, uh, in a sense, for, for uh, Germany and hence for the EU. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Chinese corporations are starting to uh, outcompete German corporations, uh, German auto, German machine tools, uh, which are so heavily reliant on both to exporting into Germany and also producing in Germany, uh, are starting to, to uh, lose their competitiveness. Uh, moreover, at the same time, of course, the United States is, is placing uh, increasing pressure on, the, on, on Germany and, uh, and the Europeans. So uh, uh, in a sense, then, what's taking place here is that China's ascent uh, renders the, the status quo in Germany and uh, hence for, for EU policy no longer viable. And... Uh, Magnus, is what makes, makes his paper very, very appealing because he really, he, he assumes this in a sense and that this becomes then a, a motive for Germany to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to carry out uh, some kind of passive revolution within, within the European Union. And I can really see the logic there. I hadn't, Magnus, I hadn't read your paper until after I finished mine, but, but, uh, but yeah, very uh, interesting in that light. Uh, but the question then becomes, uh, if the U.S.-China rivalry continues, if to an extent at least uh, we see increasingly this bifurcated uh, world, uh, then what are the implications for the European Union? Uh, just for example, what sort of trade and, uh, and uh, 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 what's, what sort of a trade deal would the EU be able to accomplish with the United States without China? there as a, as a sort of uh, a, a silent partner. And uh, I then, then uh, uh, in, in my paper, I, I address uh, three areas where the United States has carried out increasingly uh, coercive uh, diplomacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis not only China, but also Europe. And uh, these are sanctions and secondary sanctions. And uh, these are, uh, and, and I, I address each of them in turn, the uh, first is Iran. Uh, the second is Nord Stream, uh, which, of course, is, is uh, very much related to uh, Gonzalo's, uh, uh, what Gonzalo uh, presented. And then third, uh, uh, the, the sanctions on Huawei and, and uh, on technology, which, which where Europe is really the battleground uh, of this. So uh, what has Europe's response been to, to uh, and I'll, I'll be very, very brief here, uh, uh, with respect to these three areas, uh, essentially uh, what the United States did is, is, is that, uh, that there was an agreement with Iran uh, uh, in, in 2015, uh, uh, but uh, when Trump came into office in 2018 and, and then in 2018, he, he uh, abolished that ag agreement and reinstituted really draconian sanctions on Iran 
Uh, well, the impact was very, very severe on Europe and on the EU. Uh, it did two things. It deprived them of, uh, of oil imports and, uh, and, and gas, potentially in the longer run, gas imports, uh, uh, and also deprived them of, uh, of a, a very serious export market. Uh, uh, this was, of course, for Iran, really, and remains a humanitarian disaster. Uh, but what did Europe do? And the short answer is that it entirely capitulated, completely capitulated, uh, was not able to maintain it, uh, the, the, the Iran nuclear deal in any uh, substantial way. And uh, its companies uh, immediately cut off trade on, under threat from, of, uh, of American sanctions. This due obviously to the, to the, to the, uh, the importance of the American market and also of course the, the importance of of uh, the dollar. Uh, notably, in, uh, in the last few weeks, actually Germany has been, as Biden comes into office, moving closer to the United States uh, uh, position, uh, which is really interesting and we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, uh, on that. Uh, okay, the second uh, example here is Nord Stream. And uh, here there, there is a really interesting logic uh, uh, there's one pipeline already running from Siberia to, to Germany, and a second is 96% constructed. The uh, United States uh, doesn't want that pipeline because it wants to export its own natural gas to Five Germany. Five minutes, Alan. Yes. Five minutes. Oh, I, I'll, I'll easily make that. Uh, uh, and... Uh, uh, the, 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 the Nord Stream pipeline and more, ga more generally the, the natural gas is very illustrative of German power uh, because Germany is the hub for gas. So the gas goes into Germany, flows into Germany, and then Germany distributes it outward. Uh, uh, short answer here is uh, that, that sanctions have been imposed on, on uh, Nord Stream, uh, on, on the pipeline and on Germany. Uh, it does look to me in the long run as if that pipeline will be constructed. Uh, uh, it's really a red line for, for Germany. It's not gonna give up its uh, uh, connections with, with uh, Russia. And then finally, the, the, the third and last example uh, deals with Huawei and uh, technology. This is really instructive concerning US-China relations and, and Germany's role. Uh, essentially what, what has happened is, is Huawei is, completely dominant in 5G technology. There are, there are uh, European companies, Nokia, uh, 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 but they're, they're, uh, they're still quite a bit far behind. And essentially over the last six months, the United States has prevailed in, uh, in, in getting France and getting Britain. And now probably it looks like Germany also to opt out of working with Huawei extremely expensive uh, for the European uh, for the European people uh, uh, but it's a matter of sanctions and, and it's, a, it's a matter of uh, the strength of America's uh, coercive diplomacy okay so so uh, 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 just by way of, of conclusion uh, what does all this mean uh, uh, I struggled with uh, with coming to a, a final answer on this I think broadly, Atlanticism will prevail uh, for all the weaknesses of the United States. Uh, its financial and trading power are such that that uh, Europe really cannot uh, uh, fall out of the uh, of the orbit for the United States. I think the costs for Europe are going to be very great, in that uh, uh, as it cuts off relations with China, uh, you know, Magnus is right. There's an argument there. Uh, uh, that it could lead to a different political economy in Europe and the, the Germany would have, uh, have incentives to do this. I think that's something to discuss, uh, uh, but of course we're not there yet as Magnus himself uh, 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 realized in his paper. So uh, that's, uh, that's really all the conclusion that I can, can come up with now in, in my uh, allotted time, but, but uh, suffice it to say that, that uh, uh, Europe is in a, in a very uh, acute uh, position of, of geoeconomic crisis right now. 
Thank you, Alan. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been a lax chair, so we have less time than I thought. Uh, um, uh, on the other hand, there are no questions uh, on the Q&A function. If it's not clear, that is our only channel. Uh, yeah, so I invite uh, the attendees to ask questions in the Q&A in the uh, very little time that we, that we have. If there aren't any questions, maybe it's not too bad that I was a lax chair, but... Uh, uh, okay, there is one uh, question from uh, Erika Loe. It's for Marcella and Julia. Thank you for presenting a summary of the Euro Memorandum 2020. You mentioned the link between the crisis of social reproduction and the care for our planet. Would you like to expand a bit on this topic that is really topical and at the same time receives so little attention? Uh, Marcella, you also said that you had a question for Alan and Gonzalo, so you'll be very much sort of on the platform now. Can you, can you articulate that, that question? Uh, because I don't think we're going to have a lot of time left later. So, uh, so Marcella. Of course. Well, I thank Erika because actually uh, uh, we know her very well. She's at the American University at the moment. Um, Obviously, this would require a much uh, a longer uh, answer, uh, but definitely uh, the main point here is to uh, stress uh, the meaning of care um, really out of the usual way that uh, the economic paradigm does, when it does. <laughs> so uh, care is recognition, uh, care is also respect, and in that sense uh, is, first of all, respect for the planet. Um, if I had more time, I would certainly argue more. Maybe Julia wants to add something on that. But at first, I, I wanted to put some on the table also some questions for Gonzalo and, and Alan that do not have uh, that, uh, that, that, of course, didn't have um, the possibility to, to argue also in terms of the feminist perspective. Uh, but there are some. Um, uh, topics that I think could uh, relate to them as well. Uh, um, so uh, one thing that refers to Gonzalo especially is the issue of the resource nationalism. Um, I'm afraid nationalism uh, that is based on resource, uh, uh, like for example in Russia, but even more in Central Asia, so in the periphery of Russia, um, brings uh, unfortunately lack of equality and so basically inequality and lack of justice, especially in terms of uh, gender justice. Um, nationalism, uh, of course, refers also to you, Magnus, uh, has been used in Europe uh, as a way to bring uh, women in power, unfortunately. So this is also a challenge uh, for European politics uh, uh, in order to find uh, a role uh, for women in decision-making that is alternative to the far right. So I would like Gonzalo to um, give some thought about uh, resource nationalism that is so crucial for Russia and the periphery of Russia. But at the same time, I wanted to also to ask Alan, uh, uh, referring again to Central Asia and to link between China and Central Asia, uh, whether you see the new Silk Road uh, uh, or better, how you see the new Silk Road uh, in this scenario that you have uh, depicted, uh, and also in terms, of course, of the role of, of Europe. As you certainly all know, the Silk Road ends in Trieste, so in Italy. Mm, that's the end of the Silk Road. And by the way, the Trieste port uh, is investing a huge amount of money in order to make uh, the port uh, at the level uh, of the traffic that the Silk Road uh, might imply. And of course, uh, we are talking about a region uh, not specifically um, related to Lega Nord, uh, but we're talking about the northeastern part of our country that, by the way, is under the control of the nationalist movements. Uh, so once again, uh, this brings also to the issue that I mentioned for Gonzalo. And Gonzalo, the last point, uh, you didn't mention Belarus. I was so surprised that you didn't mention Belarus. You mentioned Ukraine, of course, because it's much bigger <laughs> and because the crisis came first. <laughs> but unfortunately, we have a crisis in Belarus now that is even 
more important for Europe uh, because Belarus is part of the Eastern Partnership Agreements. Uh, so hope this brings some food for thought for all of us. Thank you so much. We also have a question from Robin Harnell. I, I agree or disagree. The change from Trump to Biden will encourage the EU and Germany to rebuild the Atlantic Alliance, even if that means rejecting commercial opportunities with China and Russia, because the Biden administration will insist on Europe's help in isolating both China and Russia. We don't have a lot of time left, so I think that that probably closes it, and it also gives me something to bite in. So, uh, Gonzalo, Alan, and then myself. So really, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Marcella, or, or Alan wants to go first. No, go ahead. Oh, Gonzalo, you go first. Okay, okay, thanks. So Marcella, the, 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 it's just that I discovered that I had one minute left and the, you know, I rolled on, but Belarus wasn't there. So the actual quote is even more ironically, perhaps in the context of frozen conflicts in Eastern Europe, recently in Belarus, where of course women are, uh, have been at the forefront of the, of the whole uh, resistance, but where of course, once again, uh, in, a, in a way hydrocarbon has bought uh, Lukashenko time, quite a lot of it probably. I'm, I'm really happy that you brought up the, the resource nationalism. I mean, in my, in my own uh, way of thinking about this, the resources come first, the nationalism comes later and provides a number of um, symbolic, narrative, uh, justificatory uh, ways in which, in which the, the regime sustains itself. But as you say, I mean, it's no wonder uh, so, but but the but the extremely nationalist, very very machist, uh, machoist uh, kind of particular brand of uh, of right wing empty political theory. It's a kind of floating political theory waiting to be filled in with meaning. It doesn't matter. Its face is Putin. Its name maybe it's Eurasianism, um, which which I've done a little bit of work on, or or, or something else. But it is, it is some kind of uh, empty signifier, but of course very traditional uh, in a context of deep, deeply regressive uh, conditions for, for women all across Russia, for sure. Women and of course other minorities too. Alan? And, and don't yeah, forget Marcella, Anna Goskaya. <laughs> Alan. Marcella, uh, yeah, I think uh, a, a lot of Chinese investment in uh, in Eurasia the, and the Silk Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, is, has been very, very positive. And you see that in the Balkans. Uh, of course, there are divisions within the, within uh, Europe. The Balkan countries, Italy even, uh, don't necessarily owe Germany anything. And uh, and a lot of that that investment has been very welcome. So that's a that's a, that's an issue that's going to 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 become increasingly important, I think. Uh, regarding uh, U.S. Europe, uh, there is uh, all kinds of flirtation now between Biden and the Europeans, and I talk a little bit about this. There are about ten different initiatives and papers, all calling for uh, rehabilitation of the. The, the U.S.-European relationship, uh, but uh, of course, for for the Europeans, uh, it's there. We'll see uh, if you look at the, the sort of hard sanctions policies and and issues. Uh, they're going to continue. Yeah, and then there is probably the. I have you know I have a comment on to Robin's questions as well. I, I would say I would broadly agree. I think that uh, that. Uh, you, Germany would be desperate for a for a more friendly uh, American president than Ella Biden, uh, and I I also think um, that uh, it makes me actually think a little bit about my supervisor Stephen Gill, who I think overegged this idea of a uh, transnational ruling class together with Robert Cox and the Amsterdam School, but I think that. We, he wrote on the Trilateral Commission in the sort of Atlantic crisis in the 1970s, uh, the locomotive conflict, which I also talk about. And that was used as a forum for, for mending the rifts 
and that is a kind of the distinct function of those kind of uh, forums and it's not going to be the trilateral commission this time but that would be something to watch out for in this particular kind of conjuncture that those kind of forums no doubt will be playing a role and i'm not talking about world economic forum which is i think more public relations but but that would be a space to watch at the moment so so in short I agree uh okay well then we actually recovered a bit of time because we have we have uh, we have seven minutes uh yeah um so if there are any more questions and oh julia did you have any Anything that you wanted to add to uh, your and uh, uh, Marcello's question? The yes, actually, I mean, uh, uh, I also uh, uh, know Erica quite well. So thank you, Erica, for the question. And uh, I just want to add that uh, maybe also this uh, connection between care uh, for environment and caring for human being has been also um, uh, involved in a, a theoretical structure in economics that uh, is called the powerful economy uh, that uh, was uh, I mean, uh, firstly um, uh, um, declared by Ipek Ilkaman and also the, the color purple comes from uh, I mean a symbolic meaning of the color adopted by the feminist movement in some countries of the world. And so actually uh, the purple economy wants to, I mean, pawn in the center of uh, economics, the care and care, I mean, the, lab the caring labors, both for the environment and for the human beings and how it's important also to recognize uh, one's, uh, the, the part of this caring labors that uh, is, uh, um, uh, outside the formal labor market. Oh, and I, I, of course, is a complete bonehead because I've been so uh, uh, worried about being cut off at, uh, at, that I have forgotten that we actually run until, until quarter past that uh, someone in the audience was very, very uh, helpful in, in pointing out. So we, I, I, I've been actually much too breathless and, and nervous about this. So we, we have more time. And as it turns out, uh, we, ha we do have another question. And uh, I, uh, actually, and there's another one coming up. Uh, so John Sink uh, is uh, asking, for now, is there still a sense that most of the world leaders, so we'll have another round of questions. For now, is there still a sense that most of the world leaders are looking for a, a technical solution to climate change? If so, this seems to rely on engineering and scientific, presumably Russian, uh, traditional male dominated fields and ri rises as an obstacle to reorganizing society along the lines recognize, recognize the connection of care for the planet artwork that Corsi and Sakia ha ha have made. So uh, that's obviously a question for, for the two of you. Uh, uh, Robin, has another question. Thank you for reminding us that the Green New Deal anywhere in the world will be better, bo uh, both greener it is and more feminist it is as well. Uh, finally, uh, Gonzalo uh, wanted to make a comment as well. Gonzalo, do you want to put uh, your, your, your question to the table? Yes, I, I would have done it on the thing, but I can't. I, I, I... Access. No, I thought I thought it was a, um, a really interesting set of reflections that I hadn't uh, front loaded in the in the paper. Um, but I wonder, just thinking also a little bit internally, to to bring a little bit more unity to our to our different papers and the commentaries about um, about the Euro memo, um, because it seems to me there are very clear avenues between, on the one hand, environmental protection, on the other hand. Um, questions of uh, reproduction and uh, and gender equality, and on the other hand, the geopolitical strands that that come that come out of it. So I think we should, well, time time allowing, we should we should really uh, explore those. I think that's a good point. I'll I'll come back to that maybe in conclusion if there is time. I uh, Marcella and Julia, I think that the the question is the questions on the table are directed to you. 
yes, and comments. Thank you for thank you for both comments. Actually, uh, I want to address first of all the issue of technology or engineering solutions. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, the the project that Julia has described uh, at the end of our presentation, so what we call Dalila, from the name of a, a, a woman in the Bible, <laughs> quite a strong woman, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, actually it's bringing engineering into the issue. So we work with engineers uh, mostly. So our, let's call it clients, uh, in a sense that uh, the students with whom we work, especially in, in Tanzania, uh, are engineers. So that's the point. That's the point is to bring technology into a different paradigm. Mm? Um, and by the way, in terms of uh, care, and this allows me to give another answer to Erika because I was very quick with her because of you, uh, Magnus, because you made me thought that I didn't have time. <laughs> so now allow me to go back to Erika's question as well. So technology, for example, innovation in general may be the right uh, answer also to some problems that we have uh, in the care sector. Uh, I, I go back to those uh, uh, figures, so the, the key workers uh, or essential workers, uh, they're usually called um, nurses, uh, uh, for example, during the COVID crisis. Uh, we have been talking a lot about doctors, but nurses have been more important than doctors very often. So uh, in that sense, uh, um, technology uh, made for delivering care not only distributing uh, medicines, of course, uh, but also taking uh, uh, tests uh, uh, are extremely important uh, in uh, making uh, uh, care, the healthcare sector, more um, close to the needs uh, of the people. So in, other, in another field, uh, for example, in the housekeeping or in the housework, uh, uh, we all uh, are aware, I suppose, of the extremely important and revolutionary role uh, of the washing machine in the life uh, of every person that had to take care of domestic work. The same applies to the Hoover, the, play, the same applies to, to, to other instruments. That was from the past. So technology has helped a lot in terms of reconciliation, for example, of unpaid and, and paid work in the substitution of unpaid work. But now in a new scenery, in a new kind of paradigm, and also in terms of um, um, reducing waste uh, and recycling, uh, technology is, a, is the right answer, but must be technology aimed to a new paradigm hmm? concerning uh, care, first of all, concerning, uh, concerning domestic work. Uh, domotics, for example, everything can be done in the household uh, to help uh, elderly people uh, mm? and so on. I could give on and on and on uh, in, in several examples. I'm pretty sure that on this topic, Julia has things to do and things to say as well. But for example, in the context of development uh, and reducing waste uh, of using alternative energies, uh, just think about the experiences uh, in Africa, like in Latin America, of using ovens, uh, um, uh, aliment, uh, feed, uh, fed, sorry, with the new, with not with the uh, with electric, with electricity, uh, or, 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 or or standard fuels, uh, but with the solar energy. Mm? And there are a lot of experiences of this type, uh, really fitted uh, on the needs uh, of people in this case, women who had to take care of specific jobs or, or delivering specific services. So just to answer to the question, technology can be really a source of inspiration and a, a very strong ally in the direction of a feminist Green New Deal. And of course, thanks to Robin for the appreciation. Uh, I'm really glad if the message passed through. In any case, we're talking about a care revolution mm? and aero memo is always keen on big revolutions but even soft revolutions sometimes thank you julia do you have anything to add no actually not i will leave the the floor and i'm just 
stressing that how it's important also the technology for this revolution as Marcella stressed. And actually, I mean, what we are doing also in our project in Africa is also to involve the engineering. And so that's why we want also to apply technical competencies to students. So we are also building some laboratory and technical laboratories to have uh, this uh, impact on, uh, uh, on constructing also uh, new instruments and new solar, uh, for example, uh, cooking machines and something like this that are, I mean, on the frontier of these technologies for helping people. Uh, we also have a couple of questions uh, related, I think, from Ruth Indek, uh, which are, I think, to the panel as a whole for anyone who wants to take them on. And I, I guess there will be people who will want to do that. For anyone, what do you think is behind all this international trade and investment rivalry? Global stagnation and poverty, too much productive capacity, other, fear of military takeovers. And a uh, second one in the, in the same domain, does the US want to totally break from China or just limit its power? Uh, I don't think you can resist those questions, Alan. No, I'm sure you I, want I, to take them I, on. I can't. And uh, the, the first part of it, I think it's, it's all of the above. I think we need to uh, brush the dust off our, our uh, Luxembourg and Lenin and Bukharin and, and Hobson. Uh, this is a, a classical uh, crisis of uh, overproduction, uh, the drive for markets and raw materials. Uh, that's been the animating driving force of U.S. foreign policy for 200 years. And uh, it's a, perhaps a little more interesting and complicated with respect to China, but China also does have some very important ex economic expansionary imperatives. So that's a, a short answer, and I do talk about this in, in uh, the paper. Uh, uh, let's see, the, the second one was, what does the United States want? Uh, with China, that's a great question. I, I also talk about that. Um, I don't think the United States uh, 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 capitalist class uh, can afford to give up a market of 1.4 uh, billion people. Uh, so they uh, they're not being protectionist as such. They want to. They ideally they would like regime change. <laughs> I don't think they're going to get that. Uh, but I, I think it's more uh, uh, trying to blunt China's power and, uh, and to maintain its, its primacy in Asia and in the Asian economy. And yeah, I, I'm going I mean, to follow up on that. I mean, I think the thing about China, and the China is, is, is the key here, <laughs> is for the first time since the end of the Second World War, we actually have uh, possibly a proper inter-imperialist rivalry of the sort that uh, uh, that the classics analyzed. I mean, after World War II, essentially the United States was able to take the leading role in organizing capitalist space in different ways. It didn't take away uh, rival economic rivalry, but in terms of the, the, the broader strategic sectors, including security and finance, uh, they dominated that. And Europe has been subordinated to that. And I think this was greatly uh, theoretically analyzed by Polanzas in 74. Mm -hmm. And then very, very recently, one of the last things that Leo Panitch did, who sadly died recently, was to write with, uh, with Sam Gind in this wonderful book, uh, The Making of Global Capitalism. And Alan and I have also written in this, in this mold with particular focus on Europe. But I, I think that... And Regan makes a lot of sense all of a sudden. His, his two, uh, two pieces in New Left Review and Adam Smith in Beijing, you know, there, there's been a kind of a dialectic involved in finance-led capitalism uh, depending on export platforms in China. And that has generated the basis for, for developing uh, a, a capitalist rival. And that's what we are seeing now. And uh, that, uh, you know, generates very, very contradictory relations with yeah. Germany and China, yeah. Europe and China and America and China. And I still think they're trying to come to terms with it. But, but I think that it is, we are back in, in that sense to, uh, to the kind of things that the classics actually analyzed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, 
Gonzalo, and I also noticed that Marcella, if we have time, wanted to come back to that question. Gonzalo, do you have anything to say about, about this? About the China question or the what, what is behind? The what yeah, is behind. both. You know, pick, pick what you want. Yeah, I mean, the China question is best left to, to Alan and, uh, uh, and the, the other one I agree with, with Alan. But on the, on the back of that, then I can maybe poach uh, a small intervention on Marcella's point about, um, about technology. On the one hand, um, technology for care it involves, would involve a completely different kind of framework in which technology doesn't do what it does, what it does now. It's not the same kind of technology that might help us or not. It's a different, it's a different world technology in a way. And um, the other thing is that, of course, it reminded me that in my uh, very sorry paper, the, I, there is something about Russia's own attempts to deal with global warming through technological fixes or whatever. There's, but there's basically nothing. I mean, just to give you a very short indication, in Russia, renewables are only 0.16% of the mix. So there's just nothing going on. They wait another 30 years, technology or no technology. Again, this has all kinds of ramifications for other things that we've discussed. If I may? Yeah, please. Yeah, you know, maybe it's just because I work in a faculty of engineering, but <laughs> I'm more optimistic than Gonzalo. <laughs> in a sense, of course, when we speak about technology, we can speak about technology in many different ways, but the technology of the future is the immaterial one. So. Obviously, I mean, technology in terms of hardware and so on probably goes in different directions, but uh, we know who are the powerful people around the world. Uh, is Google, uh, is Bezos, uh, those are the ones that rule the technology nowadays. So in that sense, uh, especially in terms of informatics, uh, I think uh, uh, technology can be of, of help uh, in, uh, in, the use it, in using renewables, uh, in helping people to address specific needs uh, and so on. Um, obviously, I'm not speaking about bridges or skyscraper, but I mean, uh, <laughs> you, we perfectly understood each other in that sense. And, uh, and concerning uh, um, the, the question, uh, uh, why this big uh, uh, concentration of power behaves in this way? Well, the answer, of course, is only one, uh, it's power. And uh, <laughs> we are guests of the union radical political uh, economist. Uh, so uh, quite obviously, this is the answer. And as a matter of fact, the Euro Memorandum uh, has addressed uh, several times the issue of militarization, uh, has uh, moved the people and brought thoughts uh, against uh, uh, military spending uh, in Europe. Uh, so uh, definitely, I think we have to fight uh, for uh, uh, drawing resources from the military purpose into the purpose of care. Uh, once again, this will help to have uh, a better, in terms of justice and greener society and, the, and economics. But we must work all together. So I totally agree, Gonzalo. We should meet, and we must try to to fit uh, a little bit more one into the other papers. That would be a great challenge. And of course, you are all invited to the next Euromemo conference. Huh? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I think that we should actually try to reconvene at the next Euromemo. Uh, you wanted us to do that in the last one, but I don't think we were prepared. But this time around, and uh, I think also we should probably consider. Uh, some other forum as well, where we can start to write these things together, because I, I do agree with Gonzalo that they, this was surprisingly coherent, or maybe I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> um, uh, there was also uh, just, uh, we are starting to run out of time now, <laughs> uh, but there was just one comment uh, more on the Q&A, which I think is one very much, it's a comment, it's not a question, but one very worthwhile putting on the on the table from John Singh, just a comment. As market for soy and other commodities, China becomes very important for US farm states. Um, I, I think that that is a, is a very good, good comment and, uh, and, and very much worth considering. I think that they, 
they, the, the intertwining between China and the United States uh, is a very, very complex one in relation to rivalry. It's not, as we all know, straightforward. Yeah. Um, I, so uh, yeah, there are only two minutes left. Uh, I think that Magnus, we won't have time. Sorry. Marcella? No, I just wanted to add that in any case, the, the economic body center of the world is moving to Asia. I mean, that must be quite clear. I mean, US is resisting, uh, but with the new trade agreements uh, uh, between uh, and the new role uh, of China in most of uh, the in, in most of Asian countries, uh, directly or indirectly. And the new Silk Road, once again, don't forget that it's bringing together all those countries in interconnection. Uh, the Bari Center uh, is really moving away. Uh, we must face it and we must, uh, no, I mean, otherwise uh, we're well, not going anywhere. Just when I was about to wrap up, you open up this <laughs> world historical question, which uh, <laughs> that's definitely to be continued. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much for what at least I thought was a uh, was from my point of view a very 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 good and enjoyable uh, session. Uh, it's uh, starting to go on quarter past nine in the evening here in Helsinki, so uh, I think uh, I'm going to go home. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, everybody, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Magnus. Thanks, everybody. Marcella, Magnus. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Julia. See you soon. Gonzalo. See you soon. See you soon. Okay.